Welcome back to the Brahman Word, and we are continuing on with the life of Noah. Uh, I do want to apologize. Last Thursday, time just got away from me, uh, but uh, we are back at it today. So go back to Genesis chapter 6. Uh, verses, uh, we're going to look at the rest of the chapter, verses 9 through 22. We're going to see the announcement that God gives to Noah that he is to build this ark. Uh, we won't get to the actual construction until uh, Thursday. But uh, when it comes to just the announcement and the fact that uh, Noah had to have faith despite the unknown because, well, there was, the flood was a mystery at that time, which we'll get to in a second, but um, he does it still. And so uh, we will get into all of that here uh, in just a little bit. So with that being said, Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So right off the bat, we see three uh, characteristics of Noah. And um, so he is righteous, he is blameless in his generation, and then he walked with God. Uh, So first off, these terms, righteous and blameless, they do not mean uh, that Noah was perfect. Uh, Instead, he had a moral compass, uh, which, as we saw in uh, the first part of chapter 6, was not the case for many people at that time, if not everybody, despite Noah and his family. (laughs) Uh, But then blameless is really interesting. So blameless, uh, on the surface, appears that they you could get caught up in this word and think, okay, it means perfect. But the Hebrew word here actually uh, really means like complete or sound. Uh, So what this is really getting at is that, yes, Noah is not sinless, but uh, with the, uh, with the clause that follows it in his generation, that just points to the fact that Noah, uh, was not to blame it for his when it comes to comparison with the generation that he lived in. Yes, he was not sinless, but uh, compared to the generation that he was surrounded by, which, as we saw, and as we'll see again in verse 11, uh, was completely corrupt, um, Noah and his godly character stood out uh, or you could say that it was holy or set apart, um, and that is why he is considered blameless, not because he is sinless, but because uh, he actually had godly character in the midst of uh, a context that was not godly. And then finally, when it comes to Noah walking with God, this kind of gives us a flashback to Genesis 5, um, specifically Genesis 5.24, where we see with Enoch, uh, Genesis 5.24, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now, obviously, Enoch in himself is something for another day, uh, but the main thing that I want to look at is the phrase, walked with God, uh, because it is very, uh, of course, it is very similar to um Noah walking with God. However, there is a little bit of a difference in the construction of uh, these two phrases, Enoch walked with God and Noah walked with God. Here, you could actually, now it wouldn't sound correct um, in in our context, in our English context, but here uh, you could say it this way because this is how it's constructed with God walked Noah and so what I think is going on here and the reason why the author wrote it this way is to show you the dependence that Noah has to have on the Lord and well especially knowing what we're about to uh, see the announcement that is about to be given he really does have to have that dependence on the Lord um 
And then finally, I think the reason why the, the sons are mentioned here, yes, because it's to show that uh, there is going to be not just Noah and his wife, but there is going to be more people on the ark besides the two of them. But I think the main reason, too, another big reason that they're mentioned, is to show that Noah is not going to be taking this project on his own. Uh, his sons will help out with uh, the building of this ark. So in a way... Uh, they have to have the same level of faith, even though we attribute a lot of faith to Noah, which is true, don't get me wrong. But Shem, Ham, and Japheth also, also really have to have a level of faith uh, because they could have easily said to their father, this is crazy, why are we doing this, and could have left the project. But instead, they stay on uh, and they stay by their father. Now, there's obviously a sense of loyalty there, but I also think there is a level of faith there uh, that we don't really think about when it comes to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, so just something that I thought was interesting. Uh, so now verse 11, we're going back to looking at the context of the flood. Uh, verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. And this is chapter 6, sorry. Uh, now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So, uh, again, it's just the idea that the creation, God's creation, has turned on him. And has become corrupt to the point where uh, God is just, he is so just saddened by their choices. And, uh, and so now he has come up with a plan. Verse 13. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy uh, them with the uh, I will destroy them with the earth, and make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. Now, before we get into the measurements of the ark, which are fascinating. Uh, I do want to spend a little bit of time on the uh, the first thing that he mentions, that God mentions in verse 13. I've determined to make an end of all flesh. Or uh, another way of thinking about it, uh, you could interpret it as well, is uh, I've determined to make an end uh, or make the end of all flesh um, or, sorry, uh, the end of all flesh has come before me. So it, it's the idea that this is not a surprise. Like, it, it's just, he is not just a, uh, a just cruel God that punishes for no reason. No, there is definitely a reason. Um, because for the earth is filled with violence through them. And... I think the what they're, what God is trying to get at is that he's not saying that after the ark and after the flood, the world is going to be perfect because uh, Noah is just somewhat more godly. No, sin is still within the world, and, and we will see that in the life of Noah later. Uh, sin is very much still in the world and has uh, its stain on the world, which continues Um all the way through, of course, the big moment with the resurrection, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, which then defeats sin uh, when it comes to the eternal uh, destination that you and I can go to. Uh, but we still are in a sinful world until Jesus returns uh, and and defeats uh, and defeats Satan for uh, for good. And so that is very much the case here. Just because uh, Noah and his family are going to survive the ark, it does not mean that there will no longer be sin in the world. There still is. But I think what it's trying to get at is God is wanting to start anew uh, with this man that is uh, righteous and blameless and to, to try to continue to show grace uh, to his creation because yes Noah is considered righteous and blameless uh, by God but he is still uh, not perfect and so he could have been wiped out as well 
uh, Noah and his family, and that would have been seen as justified because God's standard is perfection. Uh, but thankfully, that is not the case. He gives grace to Noah. Uh, and, and of course, with you and I as followers of Jesus, we are given grace through uh, the, the sacrifice and then the resurrection of Jesus. So uh, with that being said, let's get into these measurements because this is fascinating. Uh, verse 15. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. So uh, the measurements of this is astounding. Uh, so basically, it all comes down to how long is a cubit. Uh, it's, it's hard because basically it's the idea was you go from your elbow to the tip of your longest finger. And so that, of course, was not the greatest <laughs> uh, measuring scale back in the day because everybody's different. Uh, however, through just time and, and records, we can kind of pinpoint an approximate range. Um, so, for instance, uh, it could be anywhere from 17 and a half inches, uh, which we see in ancient Hebrew, to uh, to 20.4 inches. So it's somewhere in that ballpark. So with that being said, with the idea of cubits, so this thing could be, um, with the measurements that are given, this thing could be anywhere from 440 feet in length to 510 feet in length uh, to uh, 72 feet in width uh, to 85 feet in width, uh, and then 53 feet. 40, sorry, 43 feet in height uh, to 51 feet in height. I mean, this thing is massive, it is is huge how big uh, this ark is. And of course, with everything that the Lord is about to tell him to bring onto the ark, it has to be that big. Um, by the way, if you would love to see a pretty accurate, uh, pretty close estimation to the size range, go down to Kentucky, I believe it's Williamsport, um, and there is something called the Ark Encounter there. Uh, it is from Answers in Genesis. It is a great experience. I would recommend everybody uh, to go at some point. It is phenomenal to see how big this thing really uh, potentially could have been. Um, based on the measurements that we are given and the range that those cubits are uh, based on scholarly work into what a cubit was. And so this thing is massive, <laughs> uh, but it gets more interesting. Verse 16. Make a roof for the ark and finish it uh, to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, and of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also take with you every sort of food that is eaten and stored up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. And then we have this big statement, verse 22, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. So, uh, you have all of these different uh, instructions about how many decks there are, uh, how much space there should be, about all the animals that are to be brought in, and then all the food that shall uh, that should be brought in as well. Um, it's just, it's a massive undertaking. Uh, and of course, again, Noah's not on his own. God is there to help him and uh, his family as well. For me, I think the big one, of course, it, uh, the big part of this whole section in verses 9 through 22 is verse 22. Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. He just heard about this thing called a flood, which 
what is a flood? <laughs> In Noah's context, that really is not a silly question. It really is a genuine question. What is a flood? Uh, they have no idea what a flood is. What do you mean, like, we know what water is, but how? what's a flood of waters? What does that even mean? How can that destroy all flesh? Uh, how can that cover the earth? And so this is a very confusing point for Noah. And yet it just says Noah did this and he did all that God commanded him. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm sure there were probably questions in Noah's mind and in Noah's heart about what am I doing? What's happening? Uh, what's going to happen? Uh, I'm sure it definitely crossed his mind. But yet, even despite those questions, he goes forward in faith with the project. For, so for you and I, I think the biggest thing is the faith in the, in the unknown. Yes, we may not be called to build a 510-foot uh, arc <laughs> or a 510-foot long arc uh, with a 51-foot height. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're probably not called to do that. Uh, if you are, kudos to you. Uh, that it'll take a very, very long time, um, even with the amount of machinery that we have today. Which we'll get to that when we get to the actual building of the ark on Thursday. Uh, but for me, I think that's a big part of it. So for you and I, when we are looking into the unknown, whether it's a new career, whether it's a new, uh, whether it's going to live in a new place, there is this unknown that we can very understandably be very terrified of at times and not know what's going to happen. Uh, but like Noah, I hope that we do what God has asked us to do, uh, that we do what God has commanded us to do. And we go forward with the faith that we see that Noah has. And so I hope for your sake, because I definitely feel this way at times as well, that we have just that kind of faith with uh, the within the face of the unknown. Uh, so I hope for you that this is an encouragement. And so with that being said, thanks for spending a little bit of time with me today on The Brahman Word. We will uh, be back for the building of the ark in chapter 7 on Thursday. So I will see you then. Thanks.